let me then make a start. My topic today in lecture 13 is Popper biology and evolution, really quite a wide swath of material. In Popper's logic, logic de Forschung, or the logic of scientific discovery, there are a few passing references to certain parallels between his approach and that of natural selection. But it's not something that in that book looms at all large. However, in Popper's piece, Philosophy of Science, a personal report, which is reprinted in Conjectures and Refutations, he says something about his interests prior to writing The Logic of Scientific Discovery. And in that context, a biological approach that he took to psychology looms quite large. Well, some of his essays, for example, included in All Life is Problem Solving, kind of intermingle biological and epistemological themes. Popper would seem to have given up his early work in psychology in part when he found that work similar to that which he was doing was already being undertaken by some people associated with the Würzburg approach to psychology. And it's been argued to owe a lot to Otto Seltz. But I don't know enough about Seltz's work to be able to judge this myself. Anyone interested in this would need, amongst other things, to look at Tahak's book on Popper and Seltz. In part, there was also Popper's view that problems which he'd been trying to tackle in terms of psychology were actually better pursued by seeing the issues as logical or philosophical. So he seems to have been involved in an approach which took a biological approach to psychology, but to have been a bit discouraged when he found that other people were already doing it, and also because of arguments which led him to think that he should be pursuing philosophical solutions to problems rather than the psychological ones. I am personally am not in a position to address these issues properly, just because Popper's Führerschriften, uh, which is not yet available in English, um, which is the material which is extant that contains some of the stuff that relates to his early work in psychology. Uh, I simply can't work on myself in German. I um, am not capable of undertaking academic work in German. And I, I when I was in uh, Germany at one point doing some research, uh, I found that I actually was not even able to manage um, the menus in restaurants adequately. And so I got some quite interesting surprises in terms of what turned up. And so uh, from that point of view, uh, it would be completely fruitless for me to try and pursue matters of just what intellectually was going on in Popper's work. But my understanding is that um, there is a translation currently under preparation of his Schriften into English. Further, while Popper's stuff in psychology is a theme to which he refers from time to time in his later writings, he seldom discusses in any detail just exactly what it is that he wants to say about the priority of logical philosophy over psychology. If one turns to what is to be found in Popper concerning psychology, what's up? Well, some themes we've already met, a non-inductive theory of learning. And in this, 
both animals and humans are interpreted as predisposed to interpret or understand the world in particular ways. Popper treats these predispositions as hypotheses, which doesn't mean that he's suggesting that they are consciously formulated, but more that while one could talk about their a priori status in the sense of these things happening prior to our having psychological experiences or where our psychological experiences are ordered by them, what he wants to stress is that these kinds of orderings and these kinds of anticipations may well not be correct. In some cases, there will be learning by trial and error. In other cases, animals, for example, may simply be stuck with various innately driven hypotheses, which uh, if, as it were, the hypotheses, if one spelled them out and critically appraise them, the hypotheses might be wrong, but the uh, creatures would be stuck with these. And there's a reference in the self and its brain to quite a nice paper about this um, called, I think, what the frog's eye uh, tells the frog's brain or something along these lines, which depicts frogs who could make a perfectly good living eating flies, having, as it were, built into their perceptual design a reaction to things only if they are in motion, so that they could uh, basically starve to death if surrounded by extremely still flies. And so at this level, one could see them as having a built-in hypothesis, which is actually wrong, and when they're not in a position to eliminate it. So that if they're wrong, they'll be eliminated along with their hypotheses. If you're interested in Popper's ideas about this, Anna Peterson's article in the Cambridge Companion to Popper, Malachi Harkoen's Karl Popper, The Formative Years, and also his piece in the Cambridge Companion to Popper, and also John Wetterston's The Roots of Critical Rationalism are all worth a look. All this leads Popper to a contrast in terms of how we are seen. What do I mean by this? Well, traditional empiricism, which Popper rejects, sees us as a, kind, as a kind of bucket into which information flows by way of various apertures. You may uh, uh, possibly recall uh, Pop, uh, Popper's picture of uh, um, a bucket uh, uh, in roughly looking like a, a, a human head uh, with holes, uh, as it were, but data to come into our eyes, ears, and, and mouth if we're, if we're uh, concerned with that kind of stuff. And Popper says traditional empiricism kind of displays us as being something like this, whereas by contrast for Popper, here, in part in a naturalized Kantian mode, but also apparently exploring a theme that is also found in Seltz. For him, one can see our mind as an active searchlight being directed onto things, which basically interrogates reality and highlights features of it, but which also interprets it. Indeed, Popper has from time to time stressed the degree to which our experience of the world is pre-structured or pre-formed, but at the same time stressing that our knowledge is fallible and has to be critically assessed against the world. And this really makes for a striking contrast between Popper's approach and that of more traditional empiricism. Popper was also led to draw certain parallels between his approach to epistemology and Darwinian evolutionary theory. It is, however, worth noting here that Popper said a range of different things about evolutionary theory. To sort them out, one would need to look, I think, at the specific context 
in which he was talking about them. And you can sometimes see if you read people who write on uh, Popper on these matters, uh, you can sometimes see that uh, people just pick out various things uh, in Popper about evolutionary theory, uh, either say, well, that's just a very, very odd view to take, or to say, well, there's something about what he's saying which doesn't seem to fit what he's saying at other times. But it's worth noting that in Of Clouds and Clocks, Popper indicated that he was, in what he said there, going back on views that he had earlier favored. And particularly, he suggested that, uh, he mentioned that in his Poverty of Historicism, he'd been rather dismissive of evolutionary philosophy. And in a sense, he says, now I actually uh, uh, have to recognize that I'm embracing, uh, uh, although not in quite the sense in which I was criticizing it, uh, an evolutionary approach. Popper clearly favors a broad evolutionary approach, but he has nuanced views about different aspects of evolutionary theory. He has sometimes used a phrase that he's drawn from the work of his friend uh, Ernst Gombrich, the art historian, namely the idea making comes before matching. That's to say in Darwinian theory, innovation in a fundamental sense is chance-like in its character. And if you're taking an evolutionary epistemology approach, then uh, what you come up with then has to be matched for its adequacy against reality. Selection takes place in terms of the adequacy of the, the ideas that we've come up with to the test to which it's submitted, as well as competition from other organisms. The same is true in Popper's epistemology. And if you're interested in some of the parallels that he draws between his epistemological work and uh, themes in broadly Darwinian uh, uh, approaches uh, to biology, his The Rationality of Scientific Revolutions is well worth looking at as well. Does this mean that on Popper's account, our knowledge is simply chance-like in its origins. It seems to me that in a deep sense, I think that Popper's answer is yes. Although we will not experience it in this kind of way for a variety of reasons. And one might also say that outside of our experience, there is also a causal story of uh, effects on us by the world, although I think it's problematic if you invoke that as part of epistemology, just because it's calling on substantive scientific theories. First, one may see when we get to humans, our problems themselves as acting as kind of filters come specifiers of the kind of thing that's needed for a solution to the problem. That's to say, well, what comes up as a possible answer to a problem is generated by chance, one might see our problems themselves as acting as filters on what gets up to the surface, and basically in two ways. First, they may serve as a basis on which interrogation takes place. We're looking for a solution to specific problems. We may be in a situation in which we are, as it were, able to put questions to ourselves which are directed. One might see an internal searchlight as being at work here. Second, they're filters of other kinds working for the most part unconsciously, which weed out and discard stuff which doesn't meet the kinds of specifications which we're after. Suppose, and this has certainly in my case uh, uh, to be a very much a supposition, one is writing a song or a poem and, which, and wishes to come up with a phrase with which to end a line. We interrogate ourselves, as it were, and typically come up with a lot of stuff 
which might possibly fit, having on the face of it rejected even before we're conscious of it, all kinds of other things which just wouldn't fit at all. But then we typically have to do a final weeding out at a more conscious level. And indeed, one can see the weeding out as continuing by way of intersubjective appraisal. One might ask someone, well, you know, does this work? Is this the way to do it? And they might listen to what we've done and say, well, not really. I mean, it rhymes or whatever it is. But um, and indeed, it seems to me, although quite often other people find this a little bit difficult to get into, that creativity and problem solving really in some ways crucially depend on critical appraisal by other people, which seems to me very much the critical rationalist approach. There are also on Popper's account other things at work too. First, if you're working on the problem, you are likely to put a lot of work into it by way of trying out things that turn out to fail. So you become a kind of expert at a particular problem just because you have been through and seen why all kinds of things that look hopeful ways at uh, resolving a problem actually in the end aren't any good. Not only when you're doing this do you learn that various things that might have seemed hopeful aren't in fact any good, but you also get to know the problem better, its different facets, uh, how it is that something uh, which might appear to resolve one bit of the problem actually is tripped up by other aspects of it and so on. Such that you're then likely to be, able, to be better able to appraise new ideas which are offered as possible solutions to the problem. Although we can in effect pose pr problems to ourselves, our knowledge of which develops. Uh, Popper discusses this in an interesting way in his piece, Problems, Science, Problems, Aims, Responsibilities. And adequacy to these things presumably then acts as a kind of filter. Once we've discovered what kind of thing was going wrong, we're likely not to go down that particular path again. If you're interested in the kind of role that uh, specifying and providing more information uh, about a problem can play in the process of discovery, Larry Briskman's very Popperian skeptical theory of scientific inquiry is a, really a, a, an interesting work on this theme. Second, for Popper, me, we may work with high level conjectures as to what characteristics the solution to a problem might have. That's to say, we might work with metaphysical research programs. So that, for example, if people are uh, biologists, in uh, the Darwinian tradition, they will work with Darwinian ideas as a research program, telling them to go for certain kinds of solutions to problems and not to investigate other ones. Such programs are likely to find attractive for a variety of reasons, and they may then guide us positively by giving us a, a heuristic, giving us particular suggestions as to what to do, or also negatively to try and keep us away from doing certain kind of things as to what we try out. But these programs themselves, it should be stressed, need to be understood as conjectures. We're obviously taking a risk on board. Should we be guided by such an approach? Because it's possible that it might be incorrect. These programs may be critically appraised both in terms of the adequacy of their claims to offer solutions in principle to our problems. Think back to Leibniz's criticisms of Cartesian physics but also in terms of the degree of progress or otherwise that we make in developing testable theories along the lines that they suggest. And this is why 
earlier on, I suggested that one might, while not uh, taking on Lakatos's approach, uh, learn from some of the things that Lakatos stressed, along with things that Popper stressed in terms of looking at research programs. What all this does is to suggest an account of these issues in which, even though at a certain level innovation is chance-like, or at the very least is not being instructed from outside, what's there outside can pose problems to us, but it doesn't tell us how to solve them, um, other than by way of the specification of certain aspects of the problem which we're tackling, our pattern of learning is Darwinian rather than Lamarckian. For an interesting discussion of the Darwinian-Lamarckian contrast with parallels to aspects of Popper's epistemology, see his The Rationality of Scientific Revolutions. And at the end of the day, and this should be no surprise, things work on the basis of conjecture and refutation. If you're interested in this and how people have explored this within psychology, there's a lot of interesting material on these issues in the work of the American psychologist, Donald T. Campbell. Aside from this, there are a couple of themes in Popper's work which, mention, which merit some attention. The first relates to his view or better views about the status of the theory of natural selection. Here he has over time said a variety of things. What he said is not always as clear as it might have been and as a result, his views have been cited and sometimes in a not particularly helpful way in some of the controversies about the status of the theory of natural selection by its conservative religious critics. One key thing which you need to bear in mind if you approach material concerning Popper's views uh, about these things seems to me this. First of all, he's not a conservative religious critic of Darwinism. In addition, for Popper to call an idea a metaphysical research program is not to criticize it. It's simply to make a suggestion about the kind of theory that it is. That's to say, when Popper is talking about these things, he asks, is the theory one which can be empirically refuted or simply critically discussed? To call it a metaphysical research program isn't to poo-poo it. And while he raised some issues about the status of evolutionary theory, these were certainly not criticisms of the whole idea not least because he called his book Objective Knowledge in the subtitle, An Evolutionary Approach. Popper's initial but brief remarks on this topic were made in his Poverty of Historicism. There he raised the question of whether evolutionary theory was a universal law, as opposed to being a historical statement or a statement about a number of different sorts of historical events and their origin. But it's important to bear in mind the background to his discussion, which was, is there such a thing as a law of evolution or a law of evolutionary development? Uh, and where in discussing this stuff, he's in the middle of criticism of so-called historicist uses of evolutionary ideas. Popper notes in passing in the poverty that, and I quote, I see in modern Darwinism the most successful explanation of the relevant facts. So he wasn't in this stuff making a general criticism of the adequacy of Darwinism, uh, so much as saying that he thinks some people have taken a rather misleading view about what evolutionary theory is about. Later, for example, in Unended Quest, he raised the question of whether it was appropriate to see evolutionary theory as a refutable scientific theory as distinct from a metaphysical research program. Some formulations of the theory certainly didn't seem to make it clear uh, how notions of fitness could be tested. Although it's worth noting that for Popper, 
And I mentioned before, to call something a metaphysical research program isn't a term of abuse. He subsequently said slightly different things about the theory. It would seem to me that the best explanation is to say that what is referred to as evolutionary theory, I mean, what things people are talking about, may be a bit of a mixture between some things that are testable, others which are programmatic, and others which Popper has said could be seen almost as matters of situational logic. I might perhaps add as an aside here, a comment about what debate about evolution and creationism looks to me like from a Popperian perspective. I get into this and I'm discussing it just because some of Popper's ideas have been made use of in this context. First, it's important that it be clarified just what is being talked about in this area. That's to say, is it the claim that all life developed through a process of mutation and natural selection? Or is it something much more limited and specific? Also, just what is being claimed for evolutionary theory, that we have an evolutionary explanation of everything in this field to hand, or that we think that in the future, there will be an evolutionary explanation. Is it more programmatic? On the face of it, while some elements of the theory of natural selection may indeed be testable, the wider claims look much more programmatic. However, there's nothing wrong with admitting that there are programmatic elements to science, not least views which suggest what kind of explanation we should look for, and indeed that we can have arguments about the pros and cons of such programmatic ideas. They can, after all, be critically discussed. In addition, insofar as some elements are programmatic, it's fine to admit that there are things that cannot yet be explained in terms of these ideas. And that there will be ongoing arguments between different programmatic approaches within the theory of natural selection. For example, there were some uh, quite hard fought issues between uh, Richard Dawkins and Gould as to what sort of approach to natural selection one should be taking. Much of the discussion of evolution and natural selection by conservative religious critics of evolution, however, seems to me to be informed by rather simplistic ideas in the philosophy of science. In particular, there seems a complete lack of awareness of the kinds of problems and issues which we discussed in earlier lectures and also in connection with Kuhn. As a result, many proponents of evolutionary theory sometimes themselves seem reluctant to admit that their views aren't just testable science, but that they have programmatic aspects to them as well. At the same time, their critics often behave as if, if they can come up with something that can't currently be explained by evolutionary biologists, evolutionary biology should just simply be rejected. On the face of it, evolutionary theory thus in part looks like testable science, but also to be in part a research program. There, it might be compared to competitors, such as so-called intelligent design, or to various forms of creationism. There is, however, a difference, namely that evolutionary theory has, as it were, an explanatory heuristic. It tells people what kinds of explanations to look for, in what sorts of terms we should set about trying to explain things. Well, it's not clear that, for example, so-called intelligent design offers anything similar. At best, it suggests that in some areas, the evolutionary approach will be unsuccessful. But it's not even specific about where those uh, problems will be and why. And I might mention in passing here that there is a biologist called Michael Behe, who's written quite a bit uh, about the problems of uh, uh, Darwinian style explanations of certain things. 
The difficulty is that what he's highlighted is that it's difficult to imagine how there could have been an evolutionary path up to something playing the particular role that it now does. Other people in response have said, well, uh, they, this may not be obvious now, but it's open to us to conjecture how this might have come about. But another kind of uh, criticism that one could make of Behe is really this. Behe is in other respects perfectly happy with evolutionary explanations so that should he be right about these particular things not being things that we can explain, what you seem to end up with is, as it were, uh, nuggets of design in a sea of stuff which can be explained in evolutionary terms where there seems to be no rationale for why these particular things should be there. I mean, that's to say uh, what he seems to have to the degree to which he's effective is a list of things which we can't explain in a satisfactory manner so far. There isn't, as far as I can see, a sensible theory about why it is we should be finding these, these particular things, or uh, a theory which tells us what kind of things it is which we're not going to be able to dis explain in Darwinian terms. The defenders of intelligent design, however, are quite right to stress that ideas about design and simplicity and indeed God have played an important role in the development of science. Uh, Kepler, for example, seems to have had a strong element of religious motivation in driving him to develop his views in the way in which he did. Uh, Copernicus was in, influenced by particular uh, religious ideas. Uh, Einstein, one could also say, uh, had distinctive ideas about the kind of simplicity and intelligibility we should expect to be able to find in the universe. And thus, people who are critics of the proponents of intelligent design, who try to claim that appeals to design or God uh, have and have no possible legitimate role in science seem to me simply wrong at a historical level. I think uh, such metaphysical ideas have played an important role, and I don't see that there's anything unrespectable about them. But this indeed has typically been what the critics of intelligent design have tried to argue. And I've had some correspondence also with a guy who is an American academic lawyer who's worked in this area, uh, who has defended the idea that <coughs> in the context of science teaching, it's completely illegitimate for people to refer, for example, to ideas about God. And my feeling was, well, given that Kepler and Newton uh, invoked such notions, given that, as we noted on a previous occasion, uh, Einstein said, uh, basically, uh, God doesn't play uh, dice with the universe. To, to, to say uh, these sorts of things shouldn't be being referred to in the context of science, so it seems to me to be really rather silly. And indeed, I think these critics of intelligent design have ended up defending ideas about the history of ideas and the history of science, which in my personal view are just untenable. But what of hardline creationism? It's an interesting, if somewhat sorry story. There seems to have been a history on the part of these people of ad hoc reinterpretations of the Bible, to fit different things as they were gradually discovered. And the whole thing looks to me an interesting example of what Lakatos called a degenerative research program, albeit one with a lot of life in it yet in terms of the number of people who are interested in it. 
And there is a book by a guy called Ronald Numbers called The Creationists, which uh, offers what to me was a fascinating overview of these matters, but you guys may well have better things to spend your time on than looking at such literature. If you're interested in intelligent design as a movement, I've written a paper which has been published called Why the Hopeless War? Approaching Intelligent Design, which uh, looks a bit at the history of that movement uh, and uh, what's happened within it from a Popperian point of view. Back to Popper. I earlier mentioned that Popper had made two contributions. The second of these involved some ideas in evolutionary theory itself. They interrelate with his ideas about so-called genetic dualism and plastic control. And they have a role in his work on the philosophy of mind. Popper's concern here was in part with an old problem uh, which arose within evolutionary theory, namely, how do we understand the development of complex organs out of particular mutations when it often seems as if it's only once we have uh, fully assembled the whole organ that it would actually be useful or functional? And so there's been a lot of discussion about this kind of thing, and in a in something that's related to it, Popper came up with quite an interesting idea. The idea of so-called genetic dualism. Let me explain. Consider by analogy, the development of cars. Imagine that a car suddenly mutated so that its engine became a lot more powerful. As you may know, if you know of people who have, say, put a V8 engine into a small car, a phenomenon that was not unknown in Australia by, by hoons, as they're called there, who just wanted to, uh, uh, cars that, that had a lot of power and made a lot of noise. The results of doing this can be completely disastrous. For cars operate as a system such that if the power of an engine is suddenly increased without adjustments having been made elsewhere, the thing may become undrivable and may easily crash. There may be a mismatch between the controlling mechanisms and the power of the engine. Popper considered as a biological analog what would happen if a dragonfly suddenly acquired an extra pair of wings. I'm no expert on dragonfly, but there are, as I understand it, uh, things called, I believe, damselflies, uh, which have, uh, so I'm not very good at imitating butterflies or, uh, or dragonflies, but if you imagine my arms as, as, uh, uh, as one wing this side and one wing this side, uh, damselflies are designed like that, although the rest of the damselfly isn't anything like the rest of me because I wouldn't exactly get off the ground. Dragonflies have two pairs of wings. It's like they have uh, uh, one wing here and one wing uh, like another arm uh, coming out uh, a bit lower down on the body. Okay, And Popper was uh, saying, let's speculate. What would happen if a dragonfly suddenly acquired an extra pair of wings? Popper offered an interesting resolution of this problem, which is suggestive in other directions. For he said, consider an organism not as monistic, in which the controlling part and the organ are all just a single system, but as having two aspects to it, a purely hardware part, as it were, and what operates to control that hardware. And we're not here talking about mind and body, although it might also be used in that context, um, so much as that which actually does the control of the wings, which may be completely physical, and the wings themselves. And so what he's suggesting here is, suppose that there was a mutation in the control part of the system such that it could, in fact, handle something more sophisticated than it actually had by way of hardware. 
Suppose there was a mutation such that it could in principle also control an extra pair of wings. In these circumstances, there's no reason if it doesn't have those uh, other wings, there's no reason to suppose that it would pose any problem for it. That's to say, it wouldn't do the organism any good, but equally it wouldn't harm it either. But once it already had it, it would be in a position to make use of potentially useful mutations in hardware, which otherwise it wouldn't be able to control at all. So what he's saying is, if you have a system in which you simply have the acquisition of a second lot of wings, it's not clear that uh, it would be an advantage to the dragonfly because it's not clear that it would be equipped to control these things. By contrast, as in the case of the car and the dragonfly, if a change took place in the purely physical aspect of the thing without any improvement in the control part, it will be likely to be a disaster rather than an advantage. And as from a Darwinian perspective, there's no reason to suppose that a mutation that affected the physical stuff should also affect the controlling mechanisms in an appropriate manner. It wouldn't be clear how we could understand how things improved so as to form more complex mechanisms if the change was understood just in terms of different bits of purely physical improvement. I don't know the value of these ideas of poppers in relation to biology. Others had independently made in some ways similar suggestions to which Popper referred uh, when developing his own version of them, notably, for example, Sir Alistair Hardy, who'd written a book on this topic. But they also have another and rather interesting feature to them. For one slightly disconcerting aspect of Darwinism as opposed to Lamarckism, which stresses the inheritance of acquired characteristics, is that Darwinism seems to give no real role to effort and initiative. Popper's suggestion, which as far as I know is completely compatible with Darwinism, was that one could be a Darwinist, yet, um, show that there could also be a role for intention or indeed for a certain kind of vitalism. That's to say that if these things were themselves mutations, they could then have an effect on how uh, physical capacities could be used. At least in the sense that at certain points, we might have capacities in this area such that we are then able to take advantage of positive physical mutations should they turn up. But as Popper stressed in his The Rationality of Scientific Revolutions, his own underlying approach was Darwinian, not La Lamarckian. Effectively, what Popper does is to show that in certain respects, a strict Darwinian approach can simulate and explain features which otherwise one might think point in a Lamarckian direction. If you're interested in these issues at all, you might usefully look at John Watkins' book, Human Freedom After Darwin. Watkins was an able and I think underrated critical rationalist, although he had some differences uh, with Popper, and Popper didn't like uh, a reasonably systematic book that, that uh, Watkins wrote for a variety of reasons. But at one point, Watkins, this should be he supervised, the PhD thesis of a woman called Helena Cronin, which was about the Darwinian theory of natural selection. Uh, it was published subsequently as her book, the ant and the peacock. And in this context, Watkins himself became familiar with discussions in contemporary evolutionary theory. And I think, I think I'm right in saying that her other supervisor was Maynard Smith, uh, who was a leading Darwinian uh, biologist. And so they had a lot of discussions about these sorts of issues between them. And Watkins' knowledge about all this feeds into his most interesting 
book, uh, Human Freedom After Darwin. The other interesting idea that Popper introduces in his Of Clouds and Clocks is the idea of plastic control. He contrasted it with the kind of on-off control or simple mechanical causal control or what you get in a so-called master control method, which is the sort of thing that we're apt to think about when we consider one thing as exercising control over something else. Plastic control, Popper suggested, is something to be found quite widely in nature. And he offered as a picture of it or as a useful model, the kind of control that's exercised by the skin of a soap bubble over the air inside it. That's to say, you actually here have a kind of two-way interaction, but where there is a control over what happens inside the bubble, but it's not a hard control. I mean, all, all sorts of different things are going on there. Or the way in which the actions of a member of a swarm, for example, of gnats, might be controlled by the location of the center of the swarm. So that if you see uh, gnats, which are kind of tiny, uh, I'm, I'm ignorant about the biology here, but I tend to think of them as being uh, uh, small mosquito-like creatures who typically uh, sit around in swarms. So there's a whole kind of buzz of these things going on, but where um, the outlying members seem to be drawn towards the center of the swarm, even though uh, where the swarm is going isn't something rigid, they just kind of drift around, but with the outlying members being drawn towards the center. And this also, Popper suggested, gives us an interesting image of plastic control. It's an interesting idea in itself, but it has a particular resonance in relation to Popper's work, I think for three reasons. First, as he suggests, it indicates how we can have both indeterminism and control. So Popper is an indeterminist, but he doesn't equate a world in which there's indeterminism simply with a world in which everything just happens by chance. And this, the plastic construction, control stuff offers a, a sort of picture of how you can have forms of control which aren't depending on rigid determinism. Second, the kind of control that's involved is like that which is found in other areas of Popper's work, the role of critical feedback in argument and the way in which truth can function as a regulative ideal. In addition, it fits well with the kind of role that's given to control in the example of genetic dualism, which we have just discussed. It also looks interesting in relation to the mind-body problem, or how our picture of how the theories which we favor can exercise an influence over us. I'm sorry that Popper didn't discuss this notion of plastic control further in his contributions to the self and its brain which is really his most sustained approach uh, to the mind-body problem. It seems to me that on that, um, of clouds and clocks and the self and its brain are the, are the best places to go. There is a brief mention of it in the published essays, of, of, it was a series on the mind-body problem called Knowledge and the Mind-Body Problem, but much less is said in these lectures than was said in Of Clouds and Clocks. All told, the ideas set out in Of Clouds and Clocks were clearly, it seems to me, sketching a program for research. But they look to me suggestive, not least because of the interesting mix there of genetic dualism, indeterminism, and plastic control. I've referred in passing to Popper's indeterminism, and Popper on determinism and indeterminism will be the topic of my next lecture. It's a theme which Watkins suggests could be seen as lying at the heart of Popper's approach. I, I think that what he said is quite plausible, although I think it really only fits what happens once Popper um, uh, moves into perhaps the mid-1950s. 
but what his ideas were about this and how his views about determinism and indeterminism changed over time is itself an interesting story. One final note in this lecture. At the risk of repeating myself, I'd like to pose and to answer a question. That is, what is the status of the material in Popper's work on which I've been reporting on this and in the previous lecture? My response is, it is obviously not a piece of analytical philosophy. Rather, what we have here are a lot of interesting speculative ideas, which as far as I can see aren't empirical, but rather metaphysical ideas, which are open to criticism in relation to the problems towards which they were directed. And these further are problems of cosmology, of the character of the world and of our place within it. That's to say, Popper is in such material, in my view, best seen as offering us a program for research. It's a matter for ongoing work by those attracted to the kind of ideas that he's setting out to see how or if these ideas can be developed, to discover what the problems about them are and whether those problems can be overcome and how his approach relates to alternative competing theories. The substance of these ideas seems to me interesting, although there's a lot more to them than I've been able to talk about in this particular talk. But it is in, in the kind of non-justificationist approach which this invites us to take up, which in my view, makes critical rationalism so distinctive and I think makes it very different from analytical philosophy, but also so interesting and exciting. And with this, I'll call a halt, I'll stop the screen sharing and open up our meeting for criticism and discussion. Thanks very much. Can you indicate if you'd like to get in on the discussion uh, with a hand? Uh, I will tell you when I see someone's hand, uh, John has put his hand up first. So if you'd like to unmute yourself, John, and come in. Sure, sure. Uh, can you hear me? You, you bet. OK, um, just, just two questions. Is it possible that um, Popper's attitude towards, uh, uh, towards uh, Darwinism was conditioned uh, slightly by uh, his his fear of or rejection of social Darwinism to a certain extent, or that he had afraid that you know certain racialist uh, theories were very active uh, because of it. I haven't haven't come across this as an issue in mm -hmm. Popper. I mean, he's certainly scathing about uh, uh, racist theories, and he. I mean, one of the themes of the Open Society which he spelled out in a lecture which he gave, I think just after the public, probably just after the publication of the Open Society, and which is available in the collection after the Open Society, is something where Popper explains in a sense that he was struck when he had to read, and uh, read Plato and then teach it by, uh, by the degree to which in certain ways there were themes that he was all too familiar with in Hitler, which seemed to him actually to be echoing some of the bits that people tended not to talk about very much in Plato. And he was critical of these things in Plato. I think he was rather proud that Hitler didn't appear in the, open, the, the book, The Open Society, but he, it, he essentially took that to task. I am not sure that, uh, there's anything in terms of uh, Darwinism as that, that, that this played any particular role in relation to uh, Popper and Darwinism. And I think too that he's not, I mean, the critical remarks he makes about Darwinism in the poverty of historicism seem to me to be actually directed towards people who are looking for some kind of uh, overall law of evolutionary development. And Popper is, uh, is critical of that. 
But it, mm -hmm. it's striking the degree to which, I mean, not only in his own psychology has got an evolutionary character to it, but um, that he's then very happy to e embrace uh, uh, explicitly an evolutionary perspective while nonetheless uh, raising some uh, problems and questions. Mm -hmm. uh, I happen to have the book you edited, which has been quite useful oh. after the Open Society. Well, which, uh, I, 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 could, I hope... A good plug, a good plug for everybody. Well, um, no, no, no. I mean, no. you have to say, if you look at the size of it, it's very reasonably priced. Can you think of anyone <laughs> who, would, who would like a copy for Christmas or, or other other suitable Christmas festive occasions. Selected social and political writings, yeah, quite Yeah, quite but that yeah. that is actually a wee bit misleading, just on the grounds that what the book consists of is, is essentially stuff which was uh, published by Popper on these themes, but uh, never republished in any collections of his together with a whole lot of stuff which simply existed in the Popper archive. So, I mean, the selected might make it look as if one's just picking stuff out from other uh, bits of his writing. But what this is, was an attempt really uh, to put together under two covers stuff which uh, people had referred to in discussing Popper's thought, or should have referred mm -hmm. to in discussing Popper's thought, but which just simply wasn't available. John? I, I must ask you a specific question with that, because I've, I've cited in my thesis uh, uh, public and private values, yeah? Mm. Um, is it true that that was not published? You, it was sort of, it yeah. was in the archives, but never published? Yes, that's right. I mean, each of the pieces has got uh, a, a, mm -hmm. a preliminary discussion. There's some in the in the introduction. It's, it's a very interesting, pe a very interesting piece, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, what I would say is it goes back to the time of the Open Society, and uh, it it might well contain things that Popper wasn't altogether happy with. But at the same time, it, it seems to me to explain some things. Uh, a little more clearly than he'd set out in the text of, of mm -hmm. the Open Society in itself. But getting, anyway, get, getting socialists and liberals together, sort of, a lot is that's a big theme in that in that particular piece. Well, and, and there's a lot of other stuff as well. I mean, I'll talk mm -hmm. about this when I when in uh, lectures that are coming fairly soon. I, I talk about uh, Popper's political thought, but this was a, a kind of big uh, theme of his. Uh, and uh, it, it, I mean, Hayek, who was very helpful to him in getting the Open Society published and all kinds of other ways, uh, asked him to join what became the Montperrelin Society. And the Montperrelin Society is seen typically as being a kind of uh, conspiracy of wicked neoliberals. Now, uh, Popper took it as being a group of people who were, uh, essentially opposed to totalitarianism and said to Hayek, uh, what you need to do is to invite uh, a number of socialists to join the society because otherwise people, and one could spell it out in ways that Popper didn't, because otherwise people will think that the, the society is exactly what the Montpellier society later became. But I'll, I'll tell you all a bit, of, I'll, I'll tell you about that later. Okay. Very, la very last thing. Yes, of uh, course, John. The complexity and, and evolution. Um, uh, you know this this argument by the intelligent design people was that not dealt with pretty clearly by Dawkins, where he explains how, you know, the eye uh, could have um, or you know ev evolved uh, in a step by step fashion that there was no no yes. completion involved. Or well, what 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 I would was trying to say was but there had been a long running argument in that area to which one might see the Popper stuff uh, as making a contribution. I, 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 was, mm -hmm. I, I was just saying that, it's, it's that if, if you look at the controversy about uh, evolutionary theory and evolutionary explanations, what, one of the big areas was always, well, how come uh, you get things developing over time 
where it seems as if they would only be useful as opposed to a nuisance uh, once everything was in place. Mm -hmm. and, the and the human, human eye is one of those things. Yes, that that's right. Up. And I was just gesturing towards the... Uh, <laughs> to, 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 I, mean, I mean, there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of... of uh, uh, of discussion uh, of this and of related problems. So I was gesturing towards an area rather than saying uh, mm -hmm. that, that uh, there wasn't a fair bit on. Okay, thank you very much. Sir. Pleasure. I've got Syed now. I don't know if, you, I haven't seen a, a hand from you yet, Margareta, um, but I have a hand, I have a, a, an electronic hand up from Syed, so I'll take him. Ah, and now an electronic hand from Margareta. I thought she wouldn't be silenced, but no, I'm not that I was wanting to silence you, but uh, typically, Syed, would you like to come in first? Yes, hi, hi, Jeremy. Uh, you'll have to forgive me because I have an illness which affects my voice. I hope that you can hear me clearly. I put it, there is no problem, and I put it down simply to a bad internet connection. Okay, thank you. Um, I found your criticisms of intelligent design very interesting, and I agreed with them, but I just wanted to pick up on one point you made, which is that um, in the whole debate with Darwinian evolution, you, you suggested that they haven't distinguished where design ends and where evolution <laughs> begins. Um, I think with the Michael Behe thing, things have moved on since then, and I just wanted to put some uh, challenges to you of, let's say, a few things that they put to evolutionists and ask you what you think about whether these are reasonable arguments or challenges that they put forward. Um, one argument, I don't think they're so much concerned with where design ends, where evolution begins. I think they're more concerned with just refuting Darwinism. Could I just make a, a, a very yeah. brief point? My, uh, the comment that I was making was yes. specifically in relation to Behe's work. I see just on the grounds that he is someone who made claims that there are certain kinds of things which, for reasons that indeed were uh, akin to this brief discussion I had with, with, with John, uh, yeah. uh, were uh, dysfunctional until they were fully formed and saying that there didn't appear to be a path up to them. And all I was saying was, even if one granted that, the mm. difficulty about his own work would mm. seem to be that if he's right, there would appear to be kind of, as it were, pointless nuggets of design yes. in amongst a whole lot of other stuff for which he seems to be perfectly willing to accept evolutionary explanations. And so yes. my point in relation to him was that, uh, I mean, even if he were right, uh, the picture that he's offering us doesn't seem to be a very coherent one. I mean, why on earth should a, a, a few small odd things ha have been, as it were, uh, selectively designed when everything else round about them, he's willing to say could be explained in other terms? Yes, well, he's a professor of biochemistry, so he became focused on molecular machinery and the problem of irreducible complexity, which is what John was alluding to. That's the name of that problem. So I understand exactly what you're saying. However, just to put this in Popperian terms, I think the real issue is whether intelligent design is really science, because its, it's specific claim, which distinguishes it from creationism, is that it claims to be a scientific theory. Now, that's, the, that's what I'm going to slightly question you on. Uh, you'll see where I'm going with this. So one of the claims they make is what I think their aim is to try to refute neo-Darwinism. So one of the claims they make is that neo-Darwinism ultimately will not be able to explain the Cambrian explosion because of the relatively fast appearance of new body plans and life forms, because it's acknowledged in biology that genes cannot provide an explanation for that. Um, the second claim they make is that the information input into biological organ organisms in the form of DNA uh, can, also, can also not be explained by science because that has to precede the occurrence of a Darwinian process with DNA base pairs and so on. The third claim they make is beyond biology and goes into physics with a fine tuning argument which is that um, there are certain cosmological constants which came to be in the universe very shortly after the Big Bang. And again, science will not ultimately be able to explain where that 
so-called information input came from. Uh, the fourth claim they make is the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in describing the universe. Because mathematics is not subject to science as such, it's almost an assumption of science that mathematics should be able to describe the reality that we live in uh, coherently and rationally. And they say that also cannot be explained by science. So what I wanted to ask you was that, it seems to me that what they're trying to do here is essentially trying to refute neo-Darwinism by presenting them with challenges that are meant to break the theory down, saying that it cannot explain origins of life, cannot explain origins of the universe. Obviously, the, the cosmological arguments go beyond biology. So that's not to do with Darwinism anyway. So they're challenging the current models of physics and, and, and biology, which seem to be based on reductionist materialism. So the question that then arises is that, is that a metaphysical philosophical research program, or is that science? Because really, they're really do, trying to do what Popper said, which is refute a particular theory. But are their claims metaphysical or are they scientific? I oh, hope my question is clear. Yes, yes, certainly. I, I tried implicitly to address that. I guess my, my view is really that um, there are um, aspects of a Darwinian approach which are a metaphysical research program. There are also other specific things which are um, testable science. Uh, I would see intelligent design proceeding in the kind of way in which you've indicated as uh, offering various uh, metaphysical problems, um, which it is then up to uh, proponents of Darwinism to engage with. What seems to me to be striking, and this is a, something that I argued in the paper of mine to which I referred, is that um, there is, as far as I can see, no positive program for the development of science provided by proponents of intelligent design. So one has uh, within uh, the evolutionary approach, uh, a lot of stuff that it's thrown a lot of interesting light on. Um, there are certainly uh, um, problems, some of which I think are uh, in principle uh, interesting, some of which seem to me in principle to be open to uh, uh, fairly obvious in principle rebuttals, but where this, in my view, very understandably, is something which one would expect to take place by way of discussion of metaphysical theories, of whether in principle it's possible to explain things in certain kinds of ways. And I mean, the, the, of the issues to which you referred, um, the issues about information seem to me to be open to criticism just along, just broadly along the lines of saying, look, um, as we know from the argument of duems to which I've uh, referred before, um, you can have something that is described in one lot of terms where you can then have an explanation being offered of it in uh, other terms. And one would have to see whether or not that alternative explanation is a good one. And particularly whether it corrects, uh, as in addition to disagreeing with the, uh, other view. Now, part of the problem is that the intelligent design approach doesn't really have a positive program. Um, I mean, the, the, there is a guy, oh, I'm just trying to think what his name is, um, begins with D, Dem, Dembski, 
Dembski, I, I mean the name just, but where he in some of his writings said, well, you can take notions about uh, uh, in the Christian view of the word as offering, a, I mean, basically it's a matter of going back to a Neoplatonic view as the basis for an alternative. But my concern in part really is that uh, intelligent design actually more or less defined itself out of being an interesting research program because it decoupled itself from substantive notions about creation, which might have given people an alternative way of looking at things. All they seem to end up doing, as far as I can tell, is really saying, well, there are problems about um, evolutionary theory of a, in part, uh, a broadly factual kind, in part of a broadly philosophical kind. But this seems to me to be ubiquitous in the history of science. And so, uh, in my view, the evolutionary theorist can best react by saying, well, that's an interesting list. Uh, some matters are ones on which we would want to work. Uh, other matters, and I think that the one about fine tuning and so on, uh, seem to me to be very poor arguments just on the grounds that the uh, proponent of a, a Darwinian approach doesn't believe that their own existence is necessary. And so they could say simply, well, uh, if there were, uh, if it was the case that certain kinds of fine tuning uh, uh, didn't exist, then we wouldn't be here having this conversation. Uh, I don't think that I'm a necessary being. I mean, my existence is contingent. So it's not really obvious that this amounts to much of an argument. Now, um, what I'm saying about it is not that there is an easy and off pat answer to all of these things, but rather to say, no, this in terms of discussion about the pros and cons of different programs is exactly what one would expect. And the typical pattern is that questions are raised about things. There is a long period of discussion. Uh, it might lead to the modification of the views. It might be the case that the, the proponents of a view uh, come up with a response to them. But the notion which I think a lot of the intelligent design people have is, unless there is an instant answer to us immediately, Darwinism should be uh, uh, got rid of, just seems to me to be a, 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 a very poor argument in the history and philosophy of science. And I'd reiterate once again, that in part, the big problem is because they don't seem to have any actual ideas about how biological science should be operating to set out to discover explanations of things. Darwinism has a programmatic approach. It's not clear that intelligent design has a programmatic approach. And thus, what if one said to Dembski, was the guy was the name I was going for. If one said to Dembski, okay, you know, suppose you're right. How, as a biologist, should I set about uh, uh, my work? W what should offer me some guidance as an alternative to taking a Darwinian approach? Uh, that just seems to me dead, to be dead silence. Yes, I agree with you, Jeremy. That was the whole point I was making. I'm not convinced that intelligent design is a scientific research program. Um, I think it's it's presented some objections, and scientists have engaged with their objections, and have even designed some experiments to try to refute them. But I think the fundamental problem with intelligent design is its claim that it's actually a scientific research program, a well, complete scientific research program. Let, let's put it this way. You can certainly say that the proponents of intelligent design are attempting to engage with 
programmatic aspects of a Darwinian approach. And they may indeed throw up some uh, specific problems or general problems which people who favor Darwinism need to grapple with. Part of the difficulty is that wearing a Popperian hat, as it were, I would say, the proponents of uh, Darwinism often don't actually understand that they are in part offering a, a metaphysical research program themselves, and so, uh, in, in a sense, misengage with this stuff. So, I, I mean, I, I commented in, in the discussion earlier that it had seemed to me that, the, um, that in effect, there, there were bad misunderstandings on the part of both of the parties in, in some of this discussion as, as to the kind of things that they were trying to talk about. And I'd, I'd reiterate that view now. Okay. Thank you. Fine. Margareta. You're muted. You're still muted. Okay, I, I wrote down some notes in preparation for my question. I want to make sure I, I, I stated it clearly. Um, and um, so let me start. Uh, there's, there's three points that I would like to make. Uh, this is the first one, I didn't hear you say anything about the distinction between the third descriptive function and the fourth argumentative function. And um, I, I, I'm just making that as an observation because uh, two papers that Popper wrote about this, uh, one published in 1983, I think, and the other in 1982. And in the 1983, he proposes that the emergence of languages may be the bubbling of children and that they kind of discover the descriptive function of language. And um, so b before I'm... Um, closing this. So for me, uh, okay, as the footnote, I should say I was trained in agriculture and engineering and I spent four years working on transposable elements, eliminating DNA from porn. So I, I, I was not a visitor in the field, but I was actually thinking about all that stuff. And it's only afterwards that I came across Popper. And so when I started reading Popper about the the emergence of language, I thought he's so on top of it. And also what I understood, Darwinism was introduced in, in 1850 or whatever, but it took another 50 years for the, or, or maybe 80 years before everyone understood what it was about. So Popper himself, his writings, I think he's trying to say something very important and and that uh, he's trying and then he makes a few mistakes and then people look at all the mistakes and they say, oh, it's not going anywhere. But, but I think he made an extremely important point uh, just with the, the distinction between the third descriptive and the fourth argumentative function, because basically what he was pointing out is the plasticity of the human brain, that it needs to be able to switch from being purely just mental through false to argumentative, does, does that you, you lay out an argument and you both do valid and invalid reasoning. And so what I'm, I'm doing now, I'm really reading Popper always through the eyes of that argument. And then I noticed that he started publishing about it in 1939. So it's not that he, so it has been a constant theme. And I was just curious um, on your, um, your feedback to this, and then I would like to make another point or two. Yeah. Okay, uh, I, I mean, what what I would say is, I am giving in this series about twenty three lectures, and so I'm talking about different aspects of Popper's work. And okay. while you, I mean, you. You didn't say this time something about Gestalt, but yeah. there, there are various things which uh, uh, could be brought in. But I have 
I mean, if I'm going to talk about one thing, this means that in some ways I, I have to put on uh, one side various other things. So, All right. I, I mean, I'm not disagreeing that the may not, but, but it's possible that there may be illuminating things to say about this material by making parallels with that aspect of Popper's discussion of language. Uh, I, I was a bit limited uh, by what I was doing in this lecture to what I was covering. All right. Uh, and, and, I, and I completely understand because I, I think that is the basic message that people have not gotten. There are only 24 hours in our day, so our time is limited. And so we always need to prioritize. And, and so I completely, I mean, that's the whole point of, 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 of life, so to say. Um, so but I, I just pointed it out because you hadn't mentioned it even as a footnote. Now I want to get to point two, but where that is so extremely important. This, this, the scientists are making fun of the of intelligent design or they say it's not science. But I think intelligent design is a more honest and truthful uh, approach to science than all those other ones. Because all those other ones, they, they cannot explain how language came into existence in a universe where there was no human life and then there was suddenly some DNA or a pair like a fat molecules that started like organizing and then there was supposedly some DNA that started organizing and replicating and then poof, there was a bacteria and then there was something more organized and more organized. And now suddenly we have human beings and now the human beings actually get the brain all purely by accident that they're able to explain the beginning of the universe. And, and so I think uh, that is something that has been misunderstood about Darwinism, that it is a theory about change and that it is never, has never been about uh, starting with the beginning of the universe. Just Darwinism for me is variation, selection, retention. That, that is the, the, the Darwinian heuristic. And so, um, so now the, the comment I would like to make is that the, the problem in these discussions is that we have, as you said yourself, we have two arguments going on. One is about the substance of the theory, but the other is whether the person is a critical rationalist. Because a critical rationalist never will will actually try to explain the beginning of the universe. <laughs> I mean, that's the whole point of critical rationalism, that it's just a hypothesis. But then other people, they, they're somehow have never thought about it. And so they reason in a justifi justificationist manner. And so they kind of screw up the discussion because it's at, at two different levels. So, um, so that was the comment I want to make, that a lot of these discussions are at two different okay, levels, but... and it's very unfortunate that there's not more attention to, yeah. Look, what was it? It's not a, it's just a comment more, I okay. guess. Yeah. But, but, but all, all that I would say is that in my personal view, um, there was... the guy who was in many ways responsible for getting intelligent design off the ground. He was a lawyer. Um, he taught at Berkeley. Um, actually had a lot of concerns which were rather similar to some of Popper's. Mm -hmm. The problem for me, is, and I think though that as he was a lawyer, he tried to steer the intelligent design movement away from talking about religion, because he realized that um, in the context of American constitutional law, as it had developed, there was a kind of strict demarcation between religion and science. And it's one which I alluded to a little bit back, and which I think is completely untenable. But he, as a lawyer, recognizing the reality of this, basically said, uh, don't bring in the explicit content uh, about religion. And uh, 
from my perspective, the problem about this was that uh, if you compare the intelligent design people to out and out creationists who are guided by their interpretation of the Bible, the intelligent design people is, um, are I think a lot brighter than uh, intellectually than the proponents of creationism. But the proponents of creationism did have an actual specific content positively, yeah. which they were saying would serve as a program for understanding things. I mean, I think it's hopeless uh, because they tend really not to take empirical problems seriously. But um, the intelligent design people was a kind of minimalist version of this, but it was at the cost of not actually being able to say anything positive about how one should understand things. At any rate, I've set this out in a in the paper to which I referred, and also I I was engaged in some controversy with Steve Fuller um, uh. in philosophy of the social sciences, and I I well. Um, uh, uh. Can I make just one comment about Steve Fuller? One of yes. the things that I have attempted to do during the course of my academic life is to smuggle into um, uh, academic controversy various bad jokes. And I had said that Fuller seemed programmatically committed to sort of founding his own new religion. And I then said, well, and apologies to any uh, 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 Muslims who are uh, listening to this, I was suggesting really that uh, the uh, people who took this up would be known as uh, uh, followers of Fuller, or to put it another way, Fuller Shiites. <laughs> and the editor, didn't spot what I was doing. I mean, I managed, I've managed to do something like this twice. And if someone asked me, what is the highlight of your own academic career as opposed to anything else, I would say this and one other thing, which I won't repeat now. Now you had a third point yeah. and then uh, Luca's wanting to get in on this. Yeah, so uh, I, I wanted to reiterate, actually it's so, uh, it's, it's amplifying what you just told now. It is that the point of critical rationalism is that we're continuously critical and that this uh, Fuller, I, I've also noticed that he's more focused on attacking someone else instead of attacking himself at the same time and, and kind of think, are we really understanding what is going on? So, um, so I just wanted maybe to end with this uh, question, how, how you would respond if I say that really Darwinism is about change it's not about the beginning or the end of the universe and it really would be helpful if people understood it's about change so well, and popper is also about change and so that's where they're really enriching each other so yeah yes I, although i mean you may well be right it may be the case that um uh people who are critics of darwinism say but look this their approach leaves Darwin, Darwinists with a, a an outstanding problem to which we, in principle, have a solution with, to which they don't. I think they can reasonably say, well, look, our theory wasn't about that. In terms of uh, setting out uh, at the level of speculative metaphysics what their picture of things is like, I think that they could perfectly reasonably say, well, uh, maybe on this one, in terms of the origin of the universe, uh, it, it will be useful for you to talk with physicists rather than with us. Um, just, just on the grounds that, uh, I mean, it becomes a little difficult now to work out what in cosmological terms contemporary phys physicists are, are, are wanting to offer. But you, you have some suggestions that uh, the, that kind of question is one that people could 
bring within the scope of physics. You have other people saying, no, there are various alternative hypotheses, but they certainly don't at the moment. The alternatives appear to be things that offer uh, uh, testable theories. But I mean, I guess altogether, I tend to say, look, criticism, yes, but what one needs to do is to come up with alternative explanations of things that really, as I've suggested in terms of intelligent design, it's not particularly useful if you have got a fruitful and interesting uh, uh, scientific research program, which is leading to lots of interesting explanations of things to say, well, uh, you should abandon it. Uh, yeah. You can certainly come along and say, look, that there, there are some problems, but what one wants from these people is to say, okay, if you if you get rid of this, what then should you be doing? How do you look for alternative explanations? Yeah. And on this, it seems to me they're just silent. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Luke. Well, I just want to know what you think of uh, the book of Niemann on the subject. Sorry, the book of what? Of Niemann. You don't know Niemann's book? It was published in English, actually. Sorry, I, I've... Hans-Joachim Niemann, his book. You haven't read it? Uh, well, I... I... The two secrets of life. No. You don't know about it. I, I don't know it. Actually, uh, Jeremy, uh, the, there is this biology club that Popper attended in the 19, late 1940s or something, yes. a bunch of biology. So yes. it came out... It talks about that stuff, I guess. Yeah. Not only that, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Also... yeah. No, I mean, send 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 me an email. I mean, it's not something. Yes, okay. I I mean, I, I, unless un, unless I've misheard you, it's not something that I that I know anything about. So you you'd need to send me the reference. Yeah, but Hans Johan, he he wrote several books in German, but that book he wrote it in English. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. fine. Yeah. Send me the reference, okay, and then okay, I, okay, I can okay, I can see if I can have a look at it. Okay, but yes. un until I've seen it, I can't make any comment. Yes, yes, of course. Okay. 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 Anything further, anyone? Well, if sorry, Margarete, you 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 look as if you're about to say something. Yeah, John Saldino is putting comments in the chat room for us. <laughs> Okay. Uh, John, do you want to speak to the, this? Uh, I, I, if, if you don't... Uh, no, 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 not necessarily, no, it's just sort of, um, I, I was just curious is if, it's, if it's possible to be an atheist and, and favor intelligent design at the same time. Well, I think the problem, the problem I would see is really this. Uh, intelligent design, as uh, Syed was suggesting, is largely concerned with posing problems for Darwinism. Some of them, I think, are ones to, to which there's an easy response, other ones of which there's an in principle response, other things may be uh, topics where their response would be more along Margareta's lines, uh, namely saying, look, this is an interesting question, but it doesn't have anything particular to do with the theories we've been advancing. And uh, there may be other things where uh, they say, well, that, that's certainly an interesting question. I mean, if people refer to uh, the uh, Cambrian stuff and so on, I, I think part of the problem is no one really knows at the moment uh, sufficient about what was going on then to know quite how to how to tackle some of these. Uh, Sayed's so given an answer that uh, Thomas Nagel is uh, uh, in favor of it, uh, apparently. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, all, all, all I was going to say is what one has to do is just to turn around to the person and say, well, look, have you got any, you know, what specifically are your ideas for how we might explain these things? And do you have an alternative research program to Darwinism? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, it's it look, it it's open to people to uh, come up with uh, different competing views. And my own view, and when I was critical of the intelligent design people, I said effectively, look, it is fine to have 
a research program and it is fine to make criticisms, but don't overrate uh, what your criticisms uh, can actually achieve. And what you need to do is to suggest uh, another coherent programmatic approach. And so if someone said, well, they're in favor of, of uh, uh, intelligent design, uh, I would then say, well, what about, um, what, what concretely are you suggesting? How do you think we should understand things? And do you have any idea of how, um, biologists should proceed in the areas in which they've usefully being, uh, been making use of, of evolutionary theory uh, to put forward other competing understandings of, say, of the scientific work. So I'm a pluralist, um, but I think that, and I'm all in favor of metaphysical argument, uh, it's just that my overall reaction to the debate that's gone on is that uh, both a lot of the Darwinists and certainly in my, uh, uh, it, from my perspective, the ID people uh, really could do with learning a bit more about the history and philosophy of science because how they are expecting the discussion to be conducted uh, seems to me to exhibit a certain naivety about this. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, I've got a hand from Carlos and John. Is that a, a second hand of yours, or is it? No, no, no. That was the, that was just the first one. Sorry. Okay, that's fine, Carlos. Well, a very minor point. It's just curiosity. Okay, when you talk about some uh, scientists that were influenced by uh, religious belief, you talk about Kepler and then Copernicus. But uh, correct me if I am wrong. It seems that you left out Newton. Oh, yes, of course. Of... Yes, yeah. of course. Uh, sorry, yeah. I didn't want to give... Uh, I, I mean, I just started then and I moved up to Einstein. I mean, uh, uh, Newton yeah, because, is significant. Uh, and, yeah. and, because he thought that was created, that, I mean, that the, the universe was created by God. Okay. Yes. He was uh, very clear about that. So pe maybe people thinking about intelligent design are not here alone, you see. Many bright people are always looking for some uh, metaphysical, theological explanation. And this is, uh, for me, uh, even when I don't believe in, in design, I think that it's okay, we can conjecture about the universe, nobody know the right and definite answer. So it's okay. Yeah. We can talk. I agree. But what I would say is, wearing a, a critical rationalist hat, I would say, okay, if you're putting forward a theory uh, of this kind, then uh, tell us a bit about uh, the problems concerning which it, it, with which it's dealing. Tell us a bit about how it is to be um, evaluated. And if you're offering a scientific research program, then what you have to do is to tell us what kinds of explanations we should be doing and what it amounts to as a research program. And this is why, I mean, Syed said, well, they, uh, the ID people claim it's science. I think it isn't science. It is the partial articulation of a metaphysical research program for science, which really uh, 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 has uh, not much more content to it than raising a bunch of empirical and more general difficulties. But where uh, that in itself, I mean, it, it may be interesting, but you can't do much harm to a specific contentful research program which people are making use of to try and explain things just by saying there are some problems about it because they can perfectly reasonably say yes and you could say this about any scientific theory um, the significant matter is uh, are you offering us a competing research program and also let's see just whether uh, uh, we can deal with the problems that you're raising, but where some of them, 
going back to Margareta's earlier point, might be things where the biologists could say, look, I'm sorry, but our theory isn't actually about that. So uh, trying to press that on us isn't, isn't very helpful. In other cases, they might say, yes, you know, this is, a, uh, this is an interesting problem, but it's not clear that we can develop much by way of, of science concerning it at the moment, just because our information may be so limited that all we can do is really speculate. So, um, yes, the, the discussion is fine, but I think personally that the ID people have just kind of misunderstood what their task would be if they were indeed offering an alternative competing research program with Darwinism. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, if not, I'll call a halt. Margareta, you're muted. Yes, just, um, okay, I hope I'm all right now. I, I heard you say, and I think that is so important uh, this, to have a positive research program. And so I have been reading Popper now as he, he's really giving Dar, Darwinians or whoever they want to call them a positive uh, a, a, a research program that actually can become science if people do an effort to think it through. And that is, we need to look at the emergence of the ability to read and write and just try to imagine what was required for our ancestors like 20,000 years ago to, to, to start kind of changing their brain or their habit to, to read and write. And so, um, but, but then the scientist needs to admit he's talking about himself as reading and writing. And I think that's the problem, that the scientists, they think like they're somehow standing outside the universe. Well, okay, and, but, and that but, is, yeah. but evolution, I, I mean, there are various elements to this. I mean, evolutionary yeah. theory deals with all kinds of things that existed prior to human beings and the ability to read and write. And yeah. so... Uh, I've, I've also concluded last time's lecture by saying, well, look, one of the interesting issues really becomes if you think that there is emergence of various forms, how come that the physical universe is of a character which makes that possible? Uh, so I, I would say, yes, that there are interesting issues to think about. Um, Sorry, I'm, I have a cat here who wants to be fed. Uh, I don't know if uh, Ramsey. I, uh, uh, I was going to share him with everybody to to uh, try and get over the character of the problem. You but should show us the cat. Eh? <laughs> well, I attempted to do so, but he ran away. So I think at this point, uh, unless there's anything particularly pressing, I'd like you to. Uh, um, send in uh, objections and so on by email and then I can in the notes to the lecture attempt to address them if I haven't done so so far. Excuse me. Here. Yes, yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, nice guy. This is this is Ramsey. He is a half Abyssinian cat uh -huh. and basically um, his mother, I think, was a pedigree Abyssinian, and his father, who was a black cat, seems to have leaped over the garden fence and done <laughs> something that uh, his, uh, the owner of his mother would have preferred not to have happened. But he's a... Uh, is, is, he, is he named after the mathematician? <laughs> no, no, no okay. he's named after the person who built our house, who was named uh, okay, Ramsey. Okay. But at this point, I think, and with Ramsey's appearance, I should most certainly stop and we will look at some stuff to do with um, uh, determinism and indeterminism next week and the mind-body problem the week after that. And then we move off into stuff to do with political philosophy. Okay, thank you all okay. very much. Bye, and I'll go and feed him. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very bye -bye. much, Jeremy. Bye. Yeah. <laughs>